Hello and welcome to Kirkley's Local TV's weekly wind-up program. I am Pastor Napier, your host for today's show. Each week we aim to review all the news, discuss some topical issues, and hear we that impact our local community. Our aim on this program is to be interesting, informative, amusing, challenging, but certainly provocative. As we talk to you today, we expect some feedback from you. And you can do so if you follow the screen with us at info at local, Kirkley's local TV .com or on Twitter at Kirkley's local TV. Today, we are delighted to have our special guest with us. And Christina Longden is here with us. Um, she is also involved in the Lorna Young Foundation. She's not only a brainy person, but come with a wealth of experience, and guess what? She believes in fair trade. We also have with us Emily Hecker, England football player, now playing for Huddersfield Town. And if that's not enough, we have our own Kyle Warwick, one of KLTV's presenters. May I take this time to welcome you to the weekly Winder program. And today's program, we're gonna be talking about women changing the world, Considering the British Public TV license program, is there too much sport on TV? And then finally, we'll get the chance to discuss sex change. Is it a human right or too much of a burden on the NHS? Well, do you think women have enough power in today's society? That's the first question we're going to ask. Are we happy with women ruling the world for once in our lifetime? We're going to start by asking, Christina, with your experience, do you think women are now at the forefront to do something significant to impact the world? I don't think women want to rule the world. I don't think women want to have power. Uh, and I think that's one of the problems that, that we have. We, we look at, for example, the recent cabinet change, introducing women because the government's getting all a little bit worried and we need to get some women and get some women votes in here. Let's have some token women in there. Um, and I think most women are not attracted to politics, for example, because of the way that the men have behaved in politics. So we, we, we don't particularly want our daughters to go into politics as a career. Um, we might want them to go into banking, we might want them to earn a lot of money, but even then there's very, very few women at the top of those professions. And the ones that are become figureheads. Uh, but when you actually look at your average woman's earning in the UK, for example, women across the board still only earn 70% of that which a man earns, whatever the job is. Um, and I think, well, that's obviously part of that's because of institutional discrimination against women and, and tradition and you know, hundreds of years of oppression. But I think the, the actual question of whether women are becoming more powerful in this country, I would say no. I would say what we're seeing is we're seeing more women out there because of the media and because the media is so fast yeah. and, and this need to give lip service to, to women in positions of power. But I would say, if anything, women have got less power in this society and certainly when you look at other societies in the world, when you look at what's happening in sub-Saharan Africa, when you're looking at Saudi Arabia, women can't even drive. That's right. You know, it is... Women don't want power, we want equality. And we want people to stop talking about equality and to actually put it into action, rather than just chucking a few women out there and saying, right, you're all right now, love. You've got a really good job, you're earning more than me. And so, so in your experience, what you're saying to us, as a female, and I, I can't think for you, you're talking about equality in the truest sense, respect at every level, and treat us like equals. Is that the message you're trying to say? We're not here to take over the world. We're not trying to do a man's job. We just want you to be fair to us. Is that the message you're sending out? Yeah, and I think one of the problems is um, one of the problems is when we talk about feminism. There's this huge new wave now of young women that are proud to call themselves feminists. And I think, unfortunately, because a lot of women who who tried to portray feminism in the past felt that they had to do it in what was seen as a male way, it was an aggressive way, and you know, we're better than you, and we'll call you names, and then, then you receive a backlash. And I think the, the really exciting thing about younger feminisms today is that they're actually saying, they're trying to teach men and educate men what feminism is about and what it isn't about. And it isn't about being aggressive and trying to take all the best jobs. It's about what are the differences between us. Of course there are differences between men and women, but there's very, very, very few jobs. 
that a man or a woman you know a man can do and a woman can't do and it's the same within the home you know your average woman in the UK would be absolutely happy as Larry to share 50-50 childcare for example. Well I'm sure the women who are listening are going to be very happy um, just hearing Christina talk but we've got here with us um, a, pro a prolific player um, representing England and I'm sure hearing all of this and you've had your own experience in the male dominated world what do you think um, would you see yourself the England's women team playing representing England because the men seem to be rubbish at the moment uh, well I think we've been trying you know we've been trying for years I mean my experience through when I started playing football at seven years old was the first stepping stone I had was when I turned 12 years old and they said that I wasn't allowed to play with the boys football team that year they said that I wasn't allowed to you know step on a football pitch with them with with boys I wasn't allowed to share changing rooms and and I said well I'll do that before I arrive there I'll get changed and it'll just be a case of playing I, I enjoyed my football playing with the boys I, I got fitter I got faster and I also built up my strength while playing with boys but it come to a time where we entered a Charles Rice League and it was no to girls after the age of 13 years old playing. So for me, having great friends there and playing with them since I was seven years old, my sort of role then was to try and find a girls team that I'd never, I, I never knew where to start looking. Obviously it's not big on websites about girls playing football. It was quite quiet years ago. So I had to then, when back home in South Yorkshire, you see the biggest team around there was Barnsley. And they had such a big setup that was linked with the men. They were, we played in Astro, at the AstroTurf at the side of Oakwell. And after four years, that totally stopped because the boys' academy was getting bigger. Obviously, that's the grassroots that was filtering into the men. And that's where money was spent. And they looked at that as to say, you know, it was spent very well in the academies and bringing the boys up. That girls, actually, we, we don't, your slot now is going to be filled by, you know, even seven-year-old boys. And we were open-age football. So then I had to move on again and go, and I ended up going, moving to like Leeds United and moved to Doncaster Bells, playing there for six years, which I really enjoyed. And, and Doncaster again, you know, fantastic football team, managed now to go with a keep mode, but still playing for Huddersfield Town currently now for three years, you know, we've, we're in the Premier League of women's football, yet not one of us are paid. Well, you see, women seem to be rising up, taking their position, their yep. rightful position in society. And it's just interesting and informative and great to hear two women speaking so positively that they're not interested in taking over the world, but give us respect. From a male perspective, Kyle, I can't wait to bring you in here. <laughs> What's your views on the whole matter? Do you think women are doing the right thing? Um, I think women are certainly getting a more prominent role in society. I can totally sympathize with what you're saying about what's going on within football. And then, but there's some things that you said yourself, uh, I had a bit of a, I know that since the 60s, there's been an absolutely massive rise in the number of female politicians. You've gone from being sort of, of having maybe one or two female politicians in the 60s to where now a quarter of the Houses of Parliament and the House of Commons are uh, female representatives. So. I think there's, uh, there'd be some um, amongst those women who maybe take ex exception to the idea that they are kind of tokenistic members of, of parliament simply put there for, the, the, for men to feel better about, <laughs> about their role in society. I'd, I'd, I think there'd be a few politician, female politicians that would take exception with that. And I think it is finding that balance, like you say, of um, people recognising that job roles are not gender specific you know and there is a lot more now of uh, female breadwinners in in job roles that 20 25 years ago women would have it had been extremely frowned upon if you rang for a plumber and a female plumber turned up it would be that's right. but now that's not something that's that frowned upon so i think there are, there are positive improvements but i think at the same time, there's still a long way to go. That's right, sir. Yeah. So here we are saying, women, are they changing the world? Well, it's about time if they're doing. And we want to understand women are not only mothers, but they're making an impact in business, in education, in politics, in the world of sports, in music. And all they are saying, we want a level playing field to do what we think it is right. Tune in. 
to us. We're going to take a short break. We're going to get back to you. Don't switch that button. It's Kirkley's Local TV's Weekly Wind-Up. Welcome back to the lively debate that we're having here in the studio of Kirkley's Local TV, and it's a weekly wind-up program. There's always been a complaint about too much sport on TV. Sometimes it is galvanized that it's not so much sport as in football, but let us discuss it openly. And I'm going to bring in Kyle. Do you think there's too much sport and in so too much football on TV? Uh, well, I don't have Sky, so no, there isn't enough football on television. I think to an extent what is on television is driven by the viewer. As to whether there's too much sport, I think you look at when Grandstand was on television. I remember when I was a kid, Saturday television started and you had one o'clock Grandstand started and then it was sport all the way through till seven o'clock, eight o'clock at night and then you had a three hour break and it was match of the day then. So that was pretty much the entire Saturday schedule on, on the BBC that was taken up by sport. And that's kind of shifted to an extent now to where it is solely football on a Saturday. And I think that's reflected in, in reflecting the number of people that are now paying to watch football and are wanting to watch football. If, if we're going to come and I can't wait to hear Emily's view because if you watch television, it's more the male-dominated sport that we see. So, Emily, give us your honest opinion. Do well, you think there's too much sport on TV? Well, I do, yeah. I mean, I enjoy watching sport, though. I enjoy watching the males, uh, you know, the male football team play, any male sport and female sport. I enjoy any, any sport that's on TV. What I will say, though, is that when your World Cups are on, you know, your ITVs, like you said, if you, you haven't got Sky, then I do believe that the Women's World Cup then should be on ITV. <laughs> you know rather than we get pushed to Eurosport I mean the under 19s World Cup just got put on Eurosport and it was broadcasting from 11 p.m. now who's gonna watch that at that time is is you know it's not in the right mind it's not like you said it's not equal but yet when you know the boys are on they seem to be getting Sky Sports and I think oh that's fantastic but it's reflected through money I mean money in male sport especially football is very power, yes, uh, powerful. It is. It is. I think it's reflected through just this transfer window of over wow. 800 million just being spent. Yeah. That's right. It's ridiculous. I mean, you look at as well the, the kind of money that Sky put into, into football, in, into male football, in terms of they've just paid £3 billion for the rights for three seasons worth of, of showing football. Female football, uh, England games, and that is the only opportunity you really get to watch female football. It's on BBC Three, and actually, I kind of get more enjoyment out of watching the England f uh, female team than I do out of watching the men's team because the England women's team are actually of a decent standard, comparable to the best teams in the world. Mm. We just absolutely hammered Wales 4-0 and that was you know you got to watch that but the, uh, again it's kind of all all part of sport isn't it? well here, oh. hearing you say that Kyle and I'm, I'm wondering if the nation will change their mind about paying their TV license fee if they were to see more female um, sport on TV well we're going to bring in Christina um, to give us her view on the whole thing do you think the BBC is doing us an injustice we're paying our license should we have more to say and is there really too much sport I think I, I think there's too many channels. I think that's that's a problem because I grew up when there were just three channels. I remember them introducing the fourth <laughs> channel, and even then it was like, oh, You're what do I do? Four. What do I watch? <laughs> and now I don't watch the TV. I do not watch the TV. There are too many channels. There are too many cheeses in the supermarkets, and I just need a few to choose from. I'm fine with that. And that's after living in Africa, you have very little of anything and you appreciate so much of what you've got so I, I feel very I actually do feel quite strongly about the BBC and I think it's crying shame that they had to outbid the ITV for Formula One by millions of pounds yeah. just so they could say we ain't got Formula One you know it's not it's not the way that the BBC should be operated the BBC have got this fantastic quality around the world it is just brilliant you know if you've got a small child for example generally speaking 
they will go completely la la watching the other channels. Put the BBC on, you know they'll be watching something pretty educational. Yes. So I don't have a problem at all with, with my licence fee, but I do have a problem with this whole paying for sports stuff, because I think that's wrong, and I think we should all be able to see good quality sports. Right. Well, well Emily and Kyle, we'll give you the opportunity to convince the nation, convince the people in West Yorkshire that there isn't too much, and you know we, should, we, we have to continue to pay our licence fee. We haven't got a choice where that is concerned. But what's the real dilemma here? Well, I, I don't know about yourself, Emily, but for me, anyway, well, my lifestyle, I don't really watch television on my television anymore. Anyway, the programmes that I watch, I'll, I'll find a programme that I want to watch, and then I'll watch it on the iPlayer anyway. The sort of ratio of things on, on the schedule actually on the television is a very little significance to me anymore and I think to younger people it's going to be even less significant it especially is. with Netflix and mm. yes. online services that allow you to to watch programs at any time that you want to wonderful it's it's of increasing well uh, decreasing significance rather for me thank you very much we're going to give Emily the, the, the final word on this um, how can you convince the nation that we need more women in sport and don't switch off keep watching your sports on TV I think it's more about being on mainstream TV that's where it is because it is. if um, if uh, women's football matches on very rarely is it advertised early on in the week for us to remind us oh England are playing they're playing Wales this, this Saturday yeah. whereas the men are advertised at least once a day that you know England are playing Norway tonight I mean, it's all over yeah. BBC News it's all over Sky Sports yeah. you can't get away from it it's even in the papers it's making back you know big newspapers on back pages whereas if the women's football's on I think it's forgotten it I think then later on then you see a result you think oh they did all right there and it's forgotten about whereas the yeah. the men the men are you reminded all the time that the men are playing I think we all know that Rune is captain because it's splashed about That's everywhere right. it's driven, yeah whereas if we say isn't. who's the captain of the England team I think people would go Actually, I couldn't tell you. <laughs> so, so, it's, so I think it'd be nice if we just got on mainstream TV that people could look at us and watch us play football, you know, female in, in sport, not just football, but watch a, a match on TV and then think, actually, they're all right. You know, when are they playing next? Because you don't hear the next thing. Yeah. It's then forgotten about. And that's so, what the BBC should be about. Yeah, it it should, be I, about think, I think we should just be on a mainstream TV yeah. where it'd be really nice for us to get on, you know. On, well, on well the consensus and many polls have, have proven that the complaints really is coming through from really the, the over 40s. You know, they, they really complain a lot. And with, Kyle, with what Kyle has just said, with the invention of modern technology, maybe the complaint will be getting smaller because people are having their individual choices and tastes anyway. You are watching, if you've just tuned in, Kirkley's Local TV's weekly wind up and the discussions are so informative and we are getting now to our last and final point in the discussion. This one is very serious um, and very emotive. It says sex change. If you're a woman and you decide to become a man or a man and decide to become a woman, is that your human right? Emily, do you think we should have the right to choose what we want to be in life? Of course. I mean, you should also respect the fact that what you, what you were obviously born, male or female, I think you should also respect that, that, that that's what you were. But, you know, many people are very uncomfortable with how they are and growing up. That, that I think that if they do choose or they think they'll become happier to become a male or change and become a female then I think yes I think it is a right for them to do that I think everyone should have the opportunity to be happy and to and, and still be respectful right so if you put it in perspective where the NHS is so overburdened and we're looking at crucial emergency service and everybody's putting in their own piece yeah how do you weigh up those things do you think that the NHS have the right now to even be pondering or questioning whether or not they should be spending their money people who want to have a sex change well yeah I mean this there's, there's people on in newspapers who females for instance having you know implants that, that don't need them you don't they don't need them but yet they want sizes bigger it's silly you know I know it's it's probably again it'll be a feel-good factor but you know there's people in the papers recently that's been in there that that's had it on the NHS that don't need it Yet there's people out there who really want sex changes because they want to become happier and don't get it. I think it's the wrong way around. Well, lovely. I, I would like to hear Kyle's view to the 
region. How do you see this? Because um, sex reassignment is taking place all over the country. And we want to know, as somebody who's paying your, your local taxes and you know, paying into the NHS, do you think that the NHS has the right to stop these or to say that's not priority? Um, well, I, I think anything like that, um, and, and I would say that you're right as well with, uh, with kind of uh, operations for chest enlargements and, and physical things. I think they, they're kind of uh, to do with the, the person's psychology, the way that they think about themselves. Um, and I don't think really the NHS should be paying out money that could go towards life-threatening operations, well, operations on life-threatening conditions, treating people with cancer, things like that. I don't think it should be appropriated to uh, sex change operations and uh, breast enlargements, for example, other, other sort of uh, operations that are just really to do with a, a, a person's image of themselves. I think there's other ways that people could be helped really, um, not necessarily to come to terms psychologically with who they are as a person, but to understand that it isn't for the NHS to um, change them physically without it being of a, a health benefit. Lovely. Um, well, well, can we just bring Christina here um, and just hear your view? You work for the Lorna Young Foundation, and you have traveled the world and have some experience. You've advised Mr. Blair at one stage. Now, what's this whole thing? Do you think it's a burden on the NHS or the human right is more important? I think it's, it's where, how do you define human rights? I mean, where is the difference between somebody that says, I want to have IVF on the NHS, it's my right to have a child? Or somebody that says, I was completely born into the wrong, wrong body. You know, you can even go and look at my, my blood cells. You can, I can have the whole as you do in athletics, you know. And I was clearly born into the wrong body. And, and you know, again, you know, somebody that's it's suffering with all the kinds of illnesses, somebody that's, I don't know, I mean, I mean cancer is there, always, always the one that's wheeled out, isn't it? But there are so many other operations and things that happen on the NHS. And I think we need to draw a line between what is cosmetic, and you quite rightly that's address, right. you know, the that's psychological right. aspect of it, and what is actually causing not just psychological problems, but relating to the entire world that you live in. And, and I think, one, I mean, obviously having travelled overseas and, and seen the differences between how long it takes to have the whole reassignment done. I think in the UK we're pretty sensible about it. In America, because you pay, you're pushed into it a lot That's quicker. Right, do. And it's a very long and laborious process. I don't know if you know, but at Seacroft Ho Hospital over in Leeds, one of the best in the country, and it can take generally between three and five years for the process. And I think we also need to remember the dropout rate, because once you've gone into the community, if you're a man, for example, wanting to be a woman, living as a woman, you have to do it for one to two years. Yes, yeah. And then a lot of people think, actually, do you know what? I don't want to go ahead with the operation. Yes. Stuff well, like that is going I must on. Here, the, deb the debate could go on and on and on here in the studio. And unfortunately, that's all we've got time for. But this is Pastor Napier saying thank you for looking at us and see you next week on Kirkley's Local TV's weekly wind-up. Ta-ta.